This is an Overeaters Anonymous workshop about preventing and recovering from relapse, version two. It was presented on October 4th, 2020. This video was produced based on the materials presented at the online workshop for the OA Miami Dade Intergroup. The opinions expressed in the workshop reflect the experience, strength, and hope of the workshop leader and do not represent Overeaters Anonymous as a whole. Additional notes from this workshop are available at bit.ly slash OA Relapse Notes V2. Note that case is important in a bit.ly link. This workshop is an improved version of the first presentation of this workshop on June 13, 2020 for the San Jose, California OASV Intergroup. The contents of this video are shown here. The two major portions of the video are the leader's story of recovery from relapse and the talk about preventing and recovering from relapse. Hello, my name is Frank. I'm a recovered compulsive overeater. First of all, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to do this workshop. And what I'm going to start with is telling my story of recovery in OA. I start by talking about my weight history. My top weight before OA was 430 pounds. I entered OA at, at 380 pounds in August of 1979. And I lost 180 pounds in my first year in OA and got down to my goal weight of 200 pounds. And I stayed near there for about eight years. And then I went through a long period of alternating relapse and recovery for 19 years. And it wasn't all relapse because if it was all relapse, I'd be dead right now. I would have been one of those 600 pound men stuck in their room. But I alternated relapse and recovery. And during that period, I got to a higher top weight than before the program. I got up to 460 pounds. But I'd say that I spent most of my relapse period in the 350 to 400 pound range. And I went up and down from 350 to 400 at least a half a dozen times. And you know that means that I had at least a half a dozen periods of abstinence because you don't go from 400 pounds to 350 without being abstinent. And in fact, I went all the way from 460 down to 350 at some point there. So um, I had definitely had periods of abstinence mixed in with my periods of relapse. My current abstinence is 14 years as of June 25th of 2020. And I've been in the program for approximately 41 years and so I approximately had about 30 years of recovery and 10 years of relapse in those 40 years in OA. So that's the, the weight history. My story is I was born in Cincinnati, Ohio. I'm the oldest of a family of 10. So as I was growing up, there were more and more kids following behind me. But I had no idea that I had any kind of weight problem at all until seventh grade. And I was at a dinner table one time and I was reaching for a second helping of mashed potatoes and my dad made some kind of a comment like, you know, you'll be okay if you stay at this weight as you grow taller. And I had no idea that I wasn't okay at that weight already. So that was the first big impression I had. And I can obviously still remember that. But then in eighth grade, I got more information about being overweight uh, when I was teased by the boys in eighth grade and they called me hippo. And, you know, I was probably something like 10 or 20 pounds overweight. That was it. But uh, that was enough to get the name of Hippo in eighth grade. I went away to an all boys high school and luckily the name didn't stick with me there. But I gained some more weight in high school. I probably ended up uh, leaving high school around 230 pounds or something like that, or 210 pounds, I don't know. I went away to college and in my first year in college, I probably gained about another 30 or 40 pounds because they had unlimited seconds in my dormitory and I certainly didn't limit my seconds. So the weight continued to go up in college. I probably graduated from college around 280 or something like that, maybe yeah, 280, 300. And then I went out to graduate school here in California. Now I was a nerd, so I really didn't get into partying and anything. And so I, I never even really got into alcohol until graduate school. And I got first introduced to weed in my fourth year of undergrad. And I did start using weed pretty regularly in, in my undergrad there. And then in graduate school, I was a full-blown alcoholic at a, at a weed head. I was, you know, getting drunk every single night and smoking weed morning, noon, and night. And this is back when weed wasn't very powerful back then. So I wasn't doing very well in graduate school. In fact, I had to switch from a harder thesis topic to a much easier thesis topic. 
And I think that my PhD advisor let me graduate because I told him that I wasn't going to continue in physics. I was going to go into software engineering in Silicon Valley after I graduated. So I did, I did manage to graduate from graduate school and I got a job in Silicon Valley. Now, my top weight was 430 pounds during graduate school there. And I was worried about going for job interviews at 430 pounds. So I, I tried to lose some weight and I managed to get down to about 380. And I stayed right near 380 for a, a couple of years as I started work, my work career. And, you know, the thing is, I'm into quantity eating. I wasn't into sweets and, and things like that, and chocolate and ice cream. I, uh, one of my roommates taught me a, a recipe for lasagna. So I would make a tray of lasagna. And they, the idea was that this tray would last me for four meals, but it would be gone that night. I'd have my first quarter of it for my first serving. And then I go back and get a helping, a second helping, and then a third and a fourth, and it would be all gone. So quantity eating is how I, uh, how, is the kind of compulsory reader that I am. And um, so I was working and it was while I was working that I hit a bottom and the bottom wasn't just from the weed and the alcohol and the weight. It was that I uh, became friends with this woman at my work. And then for a while it was more than friends. And then she wanted to break it off again and go back to just being friends. And that's that was devastating to me because, you know, this is the only woman in the world for me. I, you know, nobody else will ever love me. And um, so I was devastated. So I looked for some help. I called the Palatine Medical Foundation and asked them if they had any kind of weight loss program or something that could help me. And they said that they did have a therapist who just came in a few weeks ago. And they gave me his number. And I called him and he said he would take me on as a client, but I have to go to Overeaters Anonymous meetings simultaneously. Thank God that there was no internet at that time, because if I had looked up on the internet that OA was a spiritual program, I would not have gone. But all I did was look in the phone book. I found the number for OA. I called the number. Somebody called me back and they told me the location of a meeting, which happened to be near me on a Wednesday at noon on the Stanford campus. So I went to my first OA meeting, not knowing what to expect. When I got there, I found out it was a spiritual program. And, you know, so they let me cross talk and I asked them, how can an atheist work this program? And they said that you didn't need to believe in a traditional higher power. And somebody at that meeting loaned me the AA big book and they said, read the chapter we agnostics, that might be helpful to you. So I took the book home, I read the chapter and then I was convinced that AA was not for me because the only message I got out of that chapter was stick with us and we'll convert you. And I did not want to be converted. No way. You know, with all my science and physics and everything, I could prove that God didn't exist because God would have to violate the laws of physics. And we know the laws of physics are correct. Therefore, God doesn't exist. So fortunately, I had been, the, the big book had been loaned to me. So I had to go back to the meeting the next week to return the big book. And I also had another dose of pain in the week between those two meetings. So I went back to the meeting and I don't think the person that loaned me the book was even there, but I listened to them again when they said that I didn't need to believe in God. I could use the meeting as the higher power or you know, anything like that. And I, so I listened to them and I actually went to my third OA meeting on the same day I went to my second meeting. The third meeting was to a bigger OA meeting down in San Jose that evening. And that had probably like 30 or 40 people. And there I got the hope that I needed because they, a man had stood up there and he was a thin man. And he stood up and he said that he had lost over 100 pounds and he had kept it off for years. And that gave me the hope that that was possible. The food plan I came up with was to count calories because being a physicist, I knew it was calories in and calories out. So I decided to have 1,500 calories a day and I could allow for one beer with dinner and still be under 1,500 calories. So I buy a six pack, I would have just the one beer but then it would never just be the one beer. As soon as I had the one beer, then I'd end up drinking the whole six pack that evening. And uh, then I blew the calorie count. And so I couldn't get abstinent for about two weeks. I tried and I just couldn't get abstinent for two weeks. So finally I realized I've got to go to AA. So I went to my first AA meeting about two weeks after I went to OA. And I've been sober ever since then. I stopped drinking alcohol ever since then because it was interfering with my, my food sobriety. So then I could be abstinent. I could stick to 1,500 calories or less, and I started to lose weight. Marijuana was not a 
problem for me because it didn't cause me the munchies or anything like that. So I continued to smoke marijuana while I was going to both OA meetings and AA meetings stoned. So that's called the marijuana maintenance program where you're on marijuana instead of alcohol. And um, I did that for about another six months and I lost probably 80, 80 pounds or something like that in the first six months of the program. And it's a good thing I did too, because I ended up getting a sore throat that wouldn't go away. And they finally diagnosed that I had a, a tumor on my, my uh, thyroid gland. And it wasn't, didn't have anything to do with my weight gain or my weight loss because it was a hypoactive tumor, but I did have to have surgery. So, you know, with smoking the weed as much as I did, I would get chronic bronchitis at least twice a year where I'd be coughing for like a month uh, with bronchitis. And I decided it would be a good idea to stop smoking weed a week before surgery, give my lungs a chance to clean out a little bit so I wouldn't end up with a lot of coughing fit after surgery. So at seven days before surgery, okay, I'm gonna to stop today. And then all six days would be enough, I'll, I'll just stop tomorrow. And then five days would be enough. My last joint was the night before surgery. So I had to go the next morning and tell the anesthesiologist that I had smoked a uh, joint last night. And, uh, and it was not a big deal for him. He was, he was fine with that. But at that time, you actually stayed in the hospital for three days after surgery instead of going home with the outpatient. So I ended up spending three days in the hospital. So I had three days clean and sober when I got out of the hospital, and I kept that up ever since then. So my sobriety date is February 1st, 1980, and I've celebrated 40 years of being clean and sober from both weed and alcohol. So, um, you know, early in that first part of the program, I did get a, a food sponsor who would help me with my food, my counting of my calories, and things like that, and tech tips and techniques for that. But sometime after my surgery there, a man came up to me and volunteered to be my step sponsor. I didn't ask him, but he just volunteered. But he had been cut out of the same mold that I had been cut out of. He had uh, lost over 100 pounds and he had kept it off for years. He was multiply addicted to both weed and alcohol and, and food. Uh, he had been an atheist when he came into the program. And so he volunteered to be my, my step sponsor and it was the, the perfect kind of step sponsor for me because I'd avoid getting a step sponsor because the steps had that word God in them. I was happy just working step one and just working with a food sponsor to lose the weight. That was all I was interested in. But the first thing he got me to do was to give up the debate. You know, So my little proof that God didn't exist, what good did that do me in my life to have that little proof? Well, it didn't do me any good at all. Whereas if I had come to believe that a power greater than myself could restore me to sanity, what good would that be? Would that do to my life? Well, being restored to sanity about food and alcohol and weed would be a good thing. So he first got me to just give up the debate. And then he got me to act as if. So he asked me to pray, even though I didn't think I was praying to anything. And so what I would do is I would say the serenity prayer. And most often when I said the serenity prayer, I got serenity because most often I was trying to change something I couldn't change. So I, I started acting as if, and I found that it worked. Praying helped me get some serenity if I said the serenity prayer. And you know, at first there, what I was using was I was using the meetings as my higher power because when I went to meetings, I, I had some strength and, and hope came out of the meeting when I came out of the meeting and that could carry me through to the next meeting and, and keep absent between meetings. But you know, meetings aren't a very portable higher power. You can't take a meeting with you when you, when you go out into life. So eventually I came up with what I call my higher self as my higher power. You know, a Christian might call it a, the Holy Spirit or um, the, what I, I was inspired by the, the program literature that talked about intuition as being the conduit from our higher power to us. You know, the idea is that if you pray for help and if you get an intuitive thought, that intuitive thought might be God's answer to your prayer. So I basically just turned my intuitive thought into my higher power. So the main thing I have to know is that the Frank that's talking to you right now, this is the Frank that's powerless over food. This is the Frank that's powerless over alcohol and marijuana. This is the Frank that whose life is unmanageable. This is the Frank who's selfish and self-centered. And there is a higher self in me that knows how to live life well, knows how to not be selfish and self-centered, knows how to not engage in any of the addictions that I have. And my goal as Frank, the addict, is to turn my will and my life over to the care of that higher power within me the higher self. So the higher self is my higher power then and it's still my higher power now. And I've gotten more elaborate theories about it. I've done a lot of research and, and I'm in the process of writing a book about it, but that's an outside issue. So I won't talk about that. 
but um, you know, I have an elaborate theory of my higher power that's explained by physics and, and things like that. So initially in the program, I was absent for eight years, as I said, and you know, I went to every retreat and every convention I could go to. At that time, our inner group was putting on two retreats a year. So I went to both retreats. The World Service was doing uh, annual conventions at that time. So I went to uh, the World Service convention every year. I went to the region two conventions, either in Northern or Southern California. And, you know, I was asked to speak at meetings all over the Bay Area. I was the, um, I started doing, doing service too. I was the uh, region two representative. And then I was the world service business conference delegate. And uh, at the end of those eight years, I was chairperson of the intergroup also. And I was planning to go to the world service business conference that year. And then what happened is I had my first binge. Um, as you can tell from my description there, my ego was getting bigger and bigger and bigger. That was the problem. I was getting more and more uh, involved in my own success and all the acclaim that I got and things like that. And what happened is I had a, a, a my first my first binge. At that time, I had gone from counting calories early on in the eight years of abstinence to by the end of there, I was just doing moderate meals. My rule when I went to a buffet restaurant was like I just have one plate. The plate might be close to having an avalanche over the edges, but if I could keep it all piled up on one plate, that would be uh, my abstinent meal. Now, hopefully it was mostly salad, so it was relatively low, large plate of food, but it would be mostly salad. So I went to this one restaurant by myself and I ended up having three plates. Now the second and third plates were much smaller than the first plate, but three does not equal one. Now at that time I happened to be in between sponsors. You know, my first sponsor moved back to the East Coast. And so I had to get another sponsor and I got another sponsor and then he moved down to Los Angeles. So I happened to be in between sponsors at the time of that binge. And I couldn't tell anybody about my binge either because all of my service positions had abstinence requirements. So if I didn't, if I wasn't abstaining, I wouldn't be able to uh, keep my commitments. And I wanted to go to the World Service Business Conference that year. I really enjoyed them. So I kept it quiet, didn't tell anybody. And then I had a second binge, you know, a week later and then another binge and another binge. And finally I put on some weight and I had to admit that I was no longer abstinent. So I gave up all my server positions and that began the 19 years of relapsing and re recovery over back and forth from one to the other. Now, the during that time, the counting of calories didn't work anymore. Uh, there was one time when I tried to use one of those liquid diets for about four months, but then I started cheating, so I stopped doing that. And I went for a bariatric surgery appointment to see if that could be a solution. And this is a group appointment where the surgeon has a group of people that are considering the bariatric surgery. And when he said that um, they consider it a success if half of the patients lose half of their excess weight, I knew that this was not for me. I knew that you could lose all of your excess weight in OA and you could keep it off for years. So I knew that the bariatric surgery was not gonna be the solution for me. So I, I did not go for this, the bariatric surgery. But I, you know, continue to struggle. And, you know, the, the problem is that during this period of relapse and recovery, I stopped going to conventions and retreats. I just never went to any convention or any retreat during that whole 19 years. Because I was embarrassed. I didn't want to see all my friends and have not gained, you know, 100 plus, 200 plus pounds back from uh, what, what they last saw me at. In June of 20, June 25th of 2006, I decided to go to the Region 2 convention. It was local that year. It was going to be in Oakland, not, not far from me. And so on the Monday before the convention, that was Monday, June 25th, 2006, I decided to go to the convention and I decided to be absent before I went to the convention because it would be good to have a few days of absence under my belt when I get to the convention. So I went to the convention. I met all the people that I hadn't seen for years because I stopped going to conventions and retreats. And you know th those people kept going. So I met a lot of people. Some of them had caught, kept their weight off, some hadn't, but they were still going to conventions and retreats. So. That was great to get back in, into, into contact with a lot of my old friends. And then the other thing is I heard a lot of recovery. You know, I went to every meeting I could of that convention and I heard a lot of recovery and I got a big dose of the program there. So I decided to do 90 meetings in 90 days after that convention. And that was working so well that I actually kept up a meeting a day for about three years. So I had about three years of doing a meeting a day of, of 
going to Overeaters Anonymous meetings. And I, I, I couldn't do it perfectly. There were some days I had to miss the meeting but then I'd go to two meetings on another day to make up for it. So I averaged that meeting a day for over a three year period. And then gradually over the period of time since then, I, I ramped it down to you know five meetings a week, then to three meetings a week. Currently, well, before Zoom, I was doing two meetings a week. Now with Zoom, I'm doing four meetings a week because it's a lot easier to get the meetings with Zoom. But, um, but that was the beginning of my recovery on June 25th of 2006. And, and the, the amazing thing is calorie counting worked again. You know, it, was, it wasn't the calorie counting that didn't work. It was me that wasn't working it. I, I wasn't willing to do it, but I was willing to do it again. So I counted calories again. And the way I counted calories is I, at this time, I had a goal of like 1800 calories was the goal I wanted to go to, but I allowed for imperfection. So I, I could go up to, you know, 2,500, maybe 3000 would be the top I would go to, but it would be allow, allow for some imperfection. But the goal was to have almost all the days be at 1800 calories or less. And I was successful at doing that. So, so right now I have 14 years of recoveries that started on that date, June 25th, 2002. And I've got 41 years in OA. Um, and that's since that's as of August of 2020, I had 41 years in OA. So, um, you know, the, I'm a compulsive reader. And the other thing that I'm addicted to is selfishness and self-centeredness. And I'll be talking a lot, a lot about that in my, the second part of this talk. And I'll just read the definitions of selfish. Selfish is lacking consideration for others, chiefly concerned with one's own profit, personal profit or pleasure. And self-centered is preoccupied with oneself and one's affairs. You know, there's a joke that this guy was talking about himself for a long time. And then he said to his friend, well, enough about me. What do you think of me? That's, that's the selfish and self-centered kind of person I, I am. So, and the thing is you can be selfish and self-centered and still try to help people if your motivation for helping them is coming from a selfish or self-centered motive. If you want them to like you, then you're, you can try to be less selfish and self-centered with them hoping that they'll like you or convince them that you're not selfish and self-centered. You know, that's how you're trying to convince them that you're not selfish and self-centered. But I'm convinced that my selfishness and self-centeredness is the root of my problems as the big book says on page 62. Selfishness, self-centeredness, that we think is the root of our problem. And that's what leads to all my other character defects. And I'll talk more about that in the uh, second part of the talk here. In terms of the food plans, like I said, I, I did counting calories and then, I, then it switched over to just kind of um, moderate meals. And my current food plan is this. And there, there are four items that I abstain from now. First of all, I abstain from starting over. I abstain from perfectionism. I abstain from negativity and I abstain from leaving OA. Now, let me talk about this for a little bit. The, you know, the, the thing is, I, my, with my moderate meal plan, that's what I'm trying to do is have moderate meals basically now that I've lost the weight and I've got down to my goal weight here. That, that's not a black and white thing. And, and the problem is there are some meals that are more moderate than other meals. And that's why I say that uh, I, I abstain from perfectionism. You know, if I have a little bit too much at one meal, it doesn't mean that I've broken my absence and I have to start all over. Now, this is me personally. I'm not, I'm not advocating that everybody else in the program should use my abstinence, my definition of abstinence, and my, my abstaining from these four items here. I understand that people who have a red light food addiction, they need to not take that first bite of that red light food. And if they take that first bite, that's usually what leads to another binge and, and uh, breaking up your abstinence. So you can be perfect on that. But if there's some part of your abstinence that you don't have to be perfect on, don't throw away your abstinence just because you weren't perfect on those parts of your abstinence. That's, that's what I'm trying to emphasize here. And for me, the no starting over is the problem is this, whenever I started over, oh, I blew it. You know, I had a big, a big meal for lunch. I blew it. Well, then I'll just eat the rest of the, whatever I want for the rest of the day. And I'll start over tomorrow. Starting over tomorrow is a guarantee for, for failure because there's always another tomorrow. Tomorrow, I can say, oh, I'll start over tomorrow. That's all right. I, I didn't have everything I wanted to eat yesterday. So I'll, 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 I'll finish everything, all my binge foods today, and then I'll be able to start over the day tomorrow again. So starting over got, is what led to a lot of my relapse and in, in my relapse and recovery period, you know, thinking that I, well, I blew it today. I'll start over tomorrow. And then tomorrow would never come. It would just go on and on and on. So that's the no starting over, no perfectionism. No negativity, that's, that's really hard for me to do. I can be very critical of myself, critical of others, critical of politics, critical of you know, whatever's going on in the world. Um, 
but you know, it doesn't help me to be negative and, and critical about things. I need to just concentrate on my side of the street and just uh, accept things the way they are is what I need to do. And then finally, I abstain from leaving OA because even if I gain all my weight back, if I'm binging my head off, I'm not going to leave this program because I know that this is the answer. There isn't other, any other answer out there in the world for me. The only, the only answer for me is Overeaters Anonymous, and I just need to keep coming back no matter what. Now, you know, being an atheist, I have never gotten into saying long prayers. I, I, I do short prayers. So my favorite short prayer is more God, less Frank. And by the way, you're perfectly happy to take that. I can use all the prayers I can get, but you can change Frank to your own name if you want to. But, you know, more God, less Frank, because that's what I need. More of God's wisdom, you know, the higher self's wisdom in my life and less of Frank's selfishness and self-centeredness in his life. It's Frank that's the selfish and self-centered part of me. And it's the higher self, which is the, the non-selfish and self-centered part. Now, you know, I got down, I, I, it took me about two years, I think, to get from my, uh, by, by the way, when I started my abstinence 14 years ago, I was 400 pounds. And it took me about two years to get down to my 210 pound goal weight. I decided, my original goal weight was 200 when I was age 30. I decided at age 60, 210 would be fine. So I got down to my 210 goal weight after about two years of abstinence. And I stayed pretty near there for a while, but gradually over a period of years, I, I was inching up slowly, just a little bit. And it wasn't from binging. It was by just having a little bit too moderate meals, you know, not moderate enough meals, uh, just gaining a little bit each time. And then occasionally I would try to, oh, I got to, you know, I got to lose some of this weight that's been going up. So I would, I would cut, try to cut back. And the other thing I left out of here is that you know, I, when I, initially I would be counting my calories, which kind of meant weighing my food or looking at the package for how many calories it was. And then eventually when I went over to just moderate meals, what I do always, I did, I did this throughout my whole 40 years in OA, is I, I weigh frequently. I weigh basically daily. I weigh my body daily. And to me, that's a backup for how, much, how my food is doing. And the thing is, as a physicist, I know that my daily weight is a very noisy signal it goes up and down by two or three pounds from one day to the other. It can make you know, all kinds of excursions. And that that's really water weight and contents of bowels and things like that. It's not that I've gained three pounds of fat in one day. I didn't eat that many calories to get three pounds of fat in one day. So I treat this as a signal with noise and I look for the long-term trend. If the long-term trend is down or flat, you know that's good. If the long-term trend is slightly up, then that means that I need to make my moderate meals a little more, more moderate. But as I said, I gradually had put on about 30 pounds altogether from my, from my 210. I got it to about 240. And about two years ago, I decided I've got to do something about this. So what am I going to do? Well, the idea that I came up with is to try to work steps one, two, and three before each meal or snack that I take. So initially, it would be like saying steps one, two, and three in my head before I eat the meal or snack. Now, Sometimes I would make a shortcut and I would just say powerless help because that's powerless is step one. Help is asking the higher power in steps two and three to help me restore me to sanity. So I would do that. And, and that was good for about 10 pounds. I lost, I went from about 240 to 230, just doing that kind of mental exercise in my head. But then I kind of flattened out at, two, at two, 220, so from 230 to 220, and I kind of flattened out at 220. So I, um, I then decided, well, I'll, I'll text to one of my sponsees. I had several sponsees and the one sponsee agreed to take my text messages each day. And I would text them the numbers one, two, three, every time before I took a meal. So that meant that if I'm, before I eat, I had to pull out my cell phone, get to my sponsees text messages, type one, two, three, send, put my phone away and then start the meal. That slowed me down and got me to work the steps a little bit better. And I, I did do, you know, I, I would take them a little bit more into my consciousness instead of just powerless help eat. So that, that worked, that was good for another 10 pounds or so. And I got down to around two, wait, two, I, I got these numbers wrong. 210 was my goal weight. I got up to 240. So I went from 240 to 230 by just doing mental one, two, three. I went from 230 to 220 by texting one, two, three. And then that wasn't working very well either because you know you can still text one, two, three pretty quickly. So then I went to texting, actually dictating to my phone a, a long text message and then have to go back and correct it. And I'll give you an example of what it became toward, what it still is nowadays, um, typically. 
So I say something like this, I dictate this to my phone with text on a text message with Google dictation. I say something like, dearest beloved higher power, I am powerless over food and my life is unmanageable, period. I came to believe that a power greater than myself can restore me to sanity. So I need your help in order to have the abstinent dinner I have sitting out in front of me right now. Also help me to be less selfish and self-centered, more God, less Frank, dearest beloved higher power, thank you for all your help. So after I finish dictating that, then I have to go in and I have to capitalize the dearest beloved higher powers because I was raised in a religion where you capitalize those words. And I have to correct any mis, you know, any, any misdictation that Google took and put in some uh, punctuation sometimes. So it would take me, you know, a little bit of time to do that. And then I hit send and then I put my phone away and then I have my meal. So that was able to get me down much closer to my goal of 210. And, um, and, and I, I, I basically got down to my goal of 210 uh, right around the time of COVID-19 here. So, uh, and I continue to do that. Now, sometimes I, I'm getting a little bit uh, laxer and sometimes I just do one, two, three breakfast, one, two, three lunch. If I'm in a rush and or people are sitting at my table and I can't dictate it uh, while they're there, I'm too embarrassed to dictate it while people are sitting at the table. I'll just get out my phone and type one, two, three dinner. But, but I still try to keep that up. And there are times when I forget and, you know, an hour later I say, oh shoot, I forgot to do my one, two, three. I'll, I'll text at that, that time. I'll say one, two, three, forgot one, two, three at breakfast at 10 a.m. or whatever it was. So that's, that's part of what I've been doing. And then even more recently, the, um, uh, you know, the, I, I, I'll talk a lot about step 10 and 11 in, in the other part of the talk here. But I, um, if you look at the step 10 prayer in the big book and the step 11 prayer in the big book, there's, a, there's one phrase that is very similar in both of those, which is thy will not mine be done. They're, not, they're slightly different in the two different steps there, but that's the core of step 10 and step 11 prayer is thy will not mine be done. So what I, what I, the, the bright idea that I finally got is to put a calendar event into my Google calendar for every evening at 11.30 p.m., saying thy will not mine be done. And then I put six notifications. They only allow six notifications, but I put six notifications about every three hours going back from that time. So it starts at seven or eight in the morning. I forget exactly what time it starts, but I get my first notification saying thy will not mine be done. And that's all Google says in the Google calendar event. That enables me to remember to say that. Because the thing is, you know, I've, I've heard of thy will not mine be done for 40 years here in the program. I never spontaneously ever said that, I don't think, you know, and off the top of my head, just thinking of it. So I need my Google Calendar event to remind me that I will not mind be done. So at least it enters my consciousness something like six times a day. And in fact, I don't swipe the notification away. So the next time I look at my phone, I might still see the notification that was there from three hours ago. Um, and, and I go on like that. So, so the I will not mind be done has been helpful to me too. So let me finish here. Um, with some of my favorite sayings. I love OA sayings. Um, and, and these are my favorites. I got a much longer list, but I can't go through all those. But one of my favorite sayings is that forgiveness is giving up all hope of a better past. Because whenever I'm holding on to a resentment, I'm holding on to the past. What that person said to me, what they did to me, they shouldn't have done that. How am I going to get back at them? That's me trying, hold, whenever I'm holding on to a resentment, I'm holding on to the past. Forgiveness of that person means giving up all hope of a better past. Because basically, I'm trying to change the past by my resentment. That's what a resentment means to me. I'm trying to change the past. So that's one of them. Another one is that I'm addicted to being right. But being right just means that I agree with myself. I mean, I love when I'm right. I love when I can prove somebody else is wrong. But that addiction doesn't do me any good. All it means is that I, I, that I agree with myself, really. You know, and I try to convince other people to agree with me too. Here's a good one. You know, I've got a PhD in thinking, but thinking is not a tool of the program. You know, thinking is not going to help me. I don't, I'm not going to get recovery by thinking in this program. Thinking is not a tool. Speaking of tools, I tend to use weapons, not tools. You know, that, that's my usual mode of operation here. Another one is I can't outsmart the disease. It's using the same brain that I am using. You know, I can't, I can't be, I can't outsmart it because it's, it's here sitting there listening to me as I'm plotting about how to outsmart the disease and it's coming up with counter, counterattacks. 
Another one is that an addict alone in his head is in a bad neighborhood. And that's me. I'm in a bad neighborhood whenever I'm alone in my head. And finally, I'll, um, this, this is not actually a program saying, but it's a saying by Mark Twain, and it definitely applies to me. He said, I've been through a lot of things in my life. Some of them have actually happened. So that's my story, and that's my story of recovery, and I think I'm just about ending on time here. So um, let me go back to the screen share just to show what we're doing here. Then we went into the question and answer period about my story. My question is, how do you maintain the willingness? I'm willing for a period of time, and I'm abstinent, and then it's like my willingness goes out the door. And um, I just spend my time kicking myself, and it's just so frustrating. Well, um, willingness is uh, kind of a hard word. I mean, because, you know, what do you, do you have to be willing to be willing? I mean, you know, where, where does willingness start? The, the thing that I found is that action is the magic word. It's not willingness. If, mm -hmm. if you're willing to do something, do it. It's not a matter of, of being willing to do it. You just do it. And so, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't have a good answer for your question, but I, I try actually try to avoid the idea of willing and willing them. Am I willing to do this? Am I willing to do that? I know that I'm willing when I actually do it. I'm willing to be abstinent when I'm abstinent. I'm willing to pray when I pray. I'm willing to go to meetings when I go to meetings. So um, action, I think, is the magic word instead of willingness. A question about imperfect abstinence was asked. Yeah, that's a good question. And I, I talk more about that in the second part of this thing here. Uh, it, to me, it's the difference between substance addiction versus behavioral addiction. Yes. I'll talk, I'll talk more about that later. But, you know, okay. I, I absolutely understand that there are some people that have red light food addictions to you know, like sugar items. Right. If they have one sugar item, they're going to have a second and a third. And, you know, who knows when they're going to mm -hmm. stop. I, I, like I said, I was more of a quantity eater. And I also knew the law of conservation of energy. And, you know, those dessert items had a lot higher calories in them. So I could eat a lot more of meat and potatoes than I would have dessert. So I would be the right. meat and potato eater, not the dessert eater. Right. So now that doesn't mean that I can't binge on desserts. I can binge on desserts too. I can binge on any food. You know, I'm a, I'm a compulsive overeater of all foods. So, right. um, so that, you know, it, it, it's a tricky thing. You know, the, the, the being imperfectly abstinent is, is a tri tricky yeah. thing. Yeah. And, you know, that the imperfect abstinence is what got me to gain some of that weight back there, you know, the okay. going up to 240 from 210. Okay. So to me, I keep the scale, the, the scale of my weighing myself on my, my body is yeah. the check of whether I'm sticking close enough to my food plan or not. Right. If, the, if the weight is inching up, that means I've, I've not been as rigorous as I need to be if it's staying yeah. fairly constant with, and, and I lit, there are literally two to three to four pound fluctuations from one day to the next. It can really be that much. Sometimes it's less, but it can be that much depending on, you know, when I went to the bathroom and mm -hmm. how, much, right. how much salt I had yesterday, for example. Mm -hmm. So um, it can, it can make a big difference in weight. So, you know, it, it, it's a tricky thing. And, um, and the, the main thing, my main message is that you have to be honest with yourself. Yeah. You know, if, you, if you're trying to have just one dessert item and stop at one dessert item, but it's almost never yeah. one dessert item, yeah. that yeah. has to be a red light food for you. Right. If, if right. you are able to stop 99.9% .9 of the time and then occasionally you binge on the dessert or have more than you wanted, say, you know, to me, a binge is eating until I can't eat anymore. And I, I haven't done that for, four, for you know, 14 years. I I haven't not had that kind of a binge in 14 years, so there have been meals that have been too big, uh, days that have been too much food, but you know it's not been to the point where you know I can't eat anymore because I'm com I'm completely stuffed, and that's what I used to do. That's how I got to 480 460 pounds. By you know, my my typical breakfast on my way to work would be to stop at a, a, a fast food joint and get six of their breakfast sandwiches. I mean, one breakfast sandwich is enough. But I wouldn't stop with one. It would be six. That's the kind of compulsive reader I was. Uh, okay. Uh, we have a, a question um, uh, for, on the chat room that said, please describe again the technique you're, uh, technique using Google Calendar for the notifications of thy will be done. Okay. 
So I put a, gal a calendar event in on every night at 1130, a repeating calendar event that repeats every night at 1130. And then I put six notifications. You can put notifications and I put them every three hours before that. So three hours before 1130, three hours, six hours before 1130, nine hours before 1130, 12 hours, you know, up to six notifications. So every three hours, I get a, count, a notification on my phone and a, a little ding saying notifications. I will not mind be done. I will not mind be done. So that gives me six notifications throughout the day. And like I said, I don't swipe the notification away completely uh, the first time I see it. So it actually stays there and I can see it more than once. So that gives me the opportunity to say six or more, I will not mind be done. And that's all it takes in my head is I will not mind be done. Just the thought of turning my will over to my higher self. That's all I got to do. Okay, there's another question here. Aren't you still getting some recovering by uh, attending meetings and working the steps, even if you aren't abstinent? Explain that difference because you said you only had 14 years of recovery, although you've been working the program for much longer. Well, uh, 14, 14 years of recovery from compulsive overeating, compulsively overeating on a daily basis and gaining a huge amount of weight. That's what I mean by recovered. Recovered from the compulsive reading. I, you know, I don't begrudge my years where I was gaining weight, but I'm still going to meetings. I, I don't go as often when I'm gaining weight than when I don't. But, uh, you know, I needed to do that. I needed to do whatever I needed to do to hit bottom. You know, the bottom is, is if you haven't hit bottom yet, you're not going to recover in this program. You have to hit bottom. And I had to hit a couple of hard bottoms, a hard bottom before I came into OA and then a hard bottom in, in OA. And the bottom is what leads to the recovery because if you've, got, if you've got the hope that you could get away with eating and not gaining weight, you know, that, that kind of a hope or whatever, it's not, the program's not gonna work. You have, to, you have to totally accept that you are powerless over food in that first step. The first step has to be absolutely solidly taken. And I'm convinced that if people take that first step completely, they can get abstinent right there and then. Now, and I'll talk more about this in the second part of the talk here. Yes, thanks, Diana, compulsive overeater here in South Florida. Okay. Um, Frank, you touched on um, marijuana, and I have a question. That's what my question has to do with. I know that um, obviously smoking marijuana um, affects or dulls our feelings. We don't feel what we need to feel, or I don't. But I wanted to know how it affected your abstinence, how it affected your food plan, just if you can elaborate on the detriment of that to your recovery? Well, I only smoked marijuana for the first six months in this program. So I don't have any experience with that for the last 39 and a half years, 40, 40 and a half years, 40 and a half years since I've had any marijuana. So, um, but like I said, it, it didn't, it didn't make me overeat. It didn't make me under eat. It, it was just a necessary drug for me to get through the day. So I, it, it didn't have a big effect on me in the program. I, I was absent while I was while I was eating the eating while I was smoking weed for the first six months in the program. I was absent. I was sticking to my fifteen hundred calories a day, and I lost weight. Okay, uh, Diana has her hand raised. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for your lead, Frank. That was phenomenal. Um, I had a question about. Um, your calorie counting, I, I found that something to be very useful as well. It's an objective boundary, you know, for energy, like you said. Um, do you still uh, very rigorously weigh and measure to track that amount of calories or, or you've gotten to the point where you just estimate ounces, grams, portions? Yeah, I uh, sometimes what I eat is prepackaged meals, like I have certain um, frozen dinners that I have. And, you know, they have the calorie on the package there, so I know what those are. Um, I, I, after all these years of weighing and measuring, I've got a, a pretty good eyeball and, you know, it's, it's buffets and, you know, meals at people's houses where there's just food that you ladle out. I, I, I just do the best I can in those cases there. I just, you know, try to, uh, put less on my plate than I would actually want to put. I put less than I want to put. That's what I do. That that's usually a good guideline. If I want to put more, try to try a little bit less. So we're now in the methods for preventing and recovering from relapse. Almost none of the content that I'm telling you in this talk here came from me. It almost all came from other people. Some of the sources of, of, the, of the stuff that I'm going to be presenting here is from a AA Big Book study 
workshop at the OALA birthday party in 2019. I went to that and a lot of my stuff that I'm talking about the big book came from, from that. I've actually been a big book fan from the beginning. I've been always interested in going to big book meetings, but a lot of stuff came from that workshop. And then there were a number of meetings where I was the speaker and I would set the topic to be recovery from relapse. And I would ask people to share on that topic in the meeting and I would make notes. So a lot of these things that I'm telling you here are notes I took from other people's shares at those meetings. Then in February of 2019, I presented a relapse workshop in Petaluma, California. And I again got feedback from there and I took notes from that. Then in June of this year, I went to a, uh, an, a Northern Virginia relapse workshop on Zoom. And they actually um, gave me permission to show some of the materials in my talk here. So I'll be showing some of the materials from that talk here. And I also got ideas from them there. And then, like I said, on June 13th, I presented version one of this talk, and this is my version two version of it. Then I also got a lot of feedback from that version one talk and uh, added that to this, to this uh, version two. And then finally, in July of 2020, there was an LA workshop on relapse that I went to, and I got some ideas from that there that, I, that I'm reporting in here. So it's all of those things that came here. And when I talk about page numbers, I'm going to be talking about page numbers in the big book. And I'm basically, whenever I say big book, I'm really referring to the first 164 pages. So the, you know, the, the all the, the, um, uh, the, the part before page one, the doctor's opinion and all the other sections there, plus up to page 164. That's the part of the big book that I'm talking about here. Okay, so let's go on to the slides. So first of all, in the doctor's opinion, he notes that the body of the alcoholic is quite as abnormal as his mind. So there's two things wrong with the alcoholic, the body and the mind. And the action of alcohol in these chronic alcoholics is a manifestation of an allergy, that the phenomena of craving is limited to this class and never occurs in the average temperate drinker. Now, when I heard the word allergy here, I thought that, you know, that's ridiculous. The, I, you know, I don't have, I don't break out in the hives when I can possibly ever eat. I don't, I don't sneeze. But allergy just means an abnormal reaction of the body. And so the, the, that's, the, that's, the, that's what an allergy is. It's an abnormal reaction of the body. And this is the allergy of the body. So this is the body part of the, of the addiction. Then in, in the, 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 the word obsession only occurs in the second edition to the foreword of the big book. And it says six months earlier, the broker had been relieved of his drink obsession by a sudden spiritual experience followed by a meeting with an alcoholic friend. So this is the obsession of the mind. So those are the two things that people classically talk about, the allergy of the body and the obsession of the mind. Now, the allergy of the body, as we said, is the phenomena of craving. And that phrase is used five times, phenomena of craving in the doctor's opinion. And craving itself is used, I think, a total of eight times in that doctor's opinion. Now, the craving I'm talking about here is the craving that comes after the first bite or the first drink. The people will sometimes say, oh, I had a craving and I had to just go get that dessert. If that's coming from your head, that's the obsession of the mind. It's not the craving of the body. The craving of the body is the one that, that gets triggered once you put the substance into your body. So the obsession of the mind has lots of different names in the big book. They don't use the name obsession of the mind, but the, the other names that they use are the insidious insanity, the peculiar mental twist, the mental states that precede a relapse, the insanely trivial excuse, the insane idea, the curious mental phenomenon, the insanely trivial justification for Bit for a, a bite, a drink, the subtle insanity that precedes the first drink, the strange mental blank spots, the no effect of mental defense against the first drink, the insanity of alcohol returns and we drink again, the queer mental condition, the mental inconsistencies, the mental twist, those insanely trivial excuses to drink, and the mental state preceding the first drink. Now, all of these things here are all examples of obsession of the mind occurring in the big book there. And when, when, when they talk about the cunning, baffling, powerful nature of this disease, it's the obsession of the mind that's the cunning, baffling, and powerful nature of this disease. That's where the, that's where the problems come from, is from the, the obsession of the mind. The, my favorite, my favorite uh, description of the obsession of the mind in the big book is from the guy who had the foolish idea that he could take whiskey if only he mixed it with milk. That foolish idea there, that was the obsession of the mind, tricking him into taking the first drink, even though he admitted that he was a, he had the allergy of the body. See, that's the thing. You're basically, whenever you take that first bite, you are saying, I don't have the obsession of the, of the allergy of the body. I don't have that allergy of the body. I can take this first bite and stop there. 
convincing yourself to overcome for the, the first steps that you took there. Now, Joe and Charlie says that the, 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 this should be the same as making the decision I should go back to the hospital again, whenever you decide to take a, that first buy or first drink. So in step 1A, we admitted we were powerless over food. This is admitting we have the allergy of the body, that we are powerless over food. So all we have to do in step one is admit that we have the allergy of the body. I absolutely admit that I have it. There's a, no question about it. There's no if, and, or buts there. I don't have to do any more experiments to see if I have the allergy of the body. My past experience is enough to convince me that I have the allergy of the body. And I believe that on 100%. Then step 1B goes on and says that our lives become unmanageable. Now the word unmanageable only appears in the big book in step one here, but there are examples of unmanageability in the, in the big book. On page 52, there's the bedevilments uh, which is the, the opposite of the, the promise, the ninth step promises. If you look at the ninth step promises and you look at that paragraph in the middle of page 52, they talk about the opposite of almost every one of those ninth step promises, the bedevilments. So it's basically our character defects, you know, things that aren't, that aren't working well in our lives. And then the other example of the unmanageability is from page 61. It's in the, the third step part of the big book where it's talking about the actor who's always trying to run the show. You know, he's not the director, he's not the producer, he's an actor, but he's trying to make everybody else do what he wants them to do in the, in the show. And it's that selfish and self-centered actor that is, is the, the cause, is, is the, that causes life to be unmanageable. So in fact, I, I say that, the, that admitting that we are, our life become unmanageable is admitting that we are powerless over our selfishness and self-centeredness. Because that's where I think all of our, my, all of my character defects come from my selfishness and self-centeredness. And admitting that I have that powerless there, as, long as, as, lo as, as well as the powerless over the allergy of the body, the powerless over taking that first bite leading to a binge, I'm also powerless over my selfishness and self-centeredness. Now, I am convinced that step one can give entire abstinence. However, to keep that abstinence, you need steps two to 12. And the reason you need steps two to 12 is because they deal with the obsession of the mind. That's how you get your recovery from the obsession of the mind is by working steps two through 12. And, and, the, and the way that you get that is by having had the spiritual awakening as the result of these steps. It's the spiritual awakening that allows you to, to uh, not buy into that obsession of the mind. You may still have an occasional thought that comes about food or whatever, but if you aren't buying into it, if you don't go out and act on that, you have overcome that obsession of the mind. And that comes from having the spiritual awakening as a result of these steps. So at this point, I'm gonna talk about this substance versus behavioral addiction. And this is also about uh, perfectionism, basically. Now in Alcoholics Anonymous and in Narcotics Anonymous, those kind of substance addictions, they can have perfect, they can have perfect abstinence from that substance. That's a bright line abstinence. They either had a drink or they didn't. You know, there's no question about it in between. So that can, you can have perfect, perfect abstinence from substances. Behavioral addictions are things like Al-Anon, Workaholics Anonymous, and the various kind of 12-step sex programs. There's several of them. And some of those have a bright line distinction that, that differentiates addictive versus non-addictive behavior. But some of them have shades of gray, a continuum between obviously addictive behavior and potentially addictive behavior and non-addictive behavior. Um, that's true in, in, in any of these other behavioral programs. For example, in Al-Anon, they don't even claim a certain number of years of abstinence or sobriety. They just claim years in the program. So there's no attempt to try to differentiate whether I was addictive or not addictive in, in any particular behavior in Al-Anon. OA has a large variety of different kinds of addictions. I, I think the largest of any other 12-step program. The substance bright light addictions are red light food items. Anybody who has a red light food addiction if you have that food, you've, you've broken your abstinence. If you haven't, you, you've kept your abstinence. But then there's behavioral addictions such as bulimia, exercise bulimia, restricting or anorexia. And some of them have a bright line. For example, bulimia, either you vomited or tried to vomit or you didn't. So that's a bright line thing. But other have more of a continuum like restricting or anorexia. You know, if you're restricting, if you're restricting a little bit, did you break your abstinence or restricted a lot, then you broke your abstinence. So it's a, it's a continuum. And then binge eating is a quantity addiction and it can be a bright line behavior. If you, if you are willing to go through weighing and measuring every single food item that goes into your mouth, you can make this into a bright line addiction also, 
or you can live with a continuum of aiming for moderate meals. And that's what I've chosen to do, to aim for moderate meals. To prevent relapse, it's essential to get this right. If you if you think that you have a substance, if you think that if you're if you have a substance addiction, but you treat it like in a continuum addiction, you will fail because if you take that first bite of your substance, you will have another bite and another bite and, and be off and binging. Similarly, if you have a continuum addiction, but you treat it like a substance, you may fail because you may be unnecessarily shooting for perfection. When you know there isn't really any perfection here, it's it's something that you made it up. So. So that's, that, that's the, uh, the difference between substance versus behavioral addiction. The main thing is to be honest with yourself. You know, don't lie to yourself and tell yourself that you have a behavioral addiction when you have a substance addiction or the other way around. You know, if you're having trouble, you might be, you might be doing the wrong kind of addiction here, a substance or a behavioral, behavioral instead of a substance. Okay, so there are two ways to prevent or recover from relapse. One is to work the steps. And the other one is to use the tools. And of course, these are the tools. So there are two ways to do it. And the thing is this, step one is enough to get abstinence, but in order to keep abstinence, you gotta work the other steps. So you can use the tools between working step one and working the other 12 steps. And you can use them there, but you can also use them if you're in the app, if, if you're in relapse and you wanna get out of it. But let me first talk about step one, about how step one is enough to start abstinence. So Bill's story is, is, about how, is a story about how step one is enough to start abstinence. Now, in the autumn of 1933, Bill has his first hospitalization for alcoholism. In the summer of 34, he has a second hospitalization. And he happens to overhear the doctor talking to Lois. And this is, this is from page seven of the big book. The doctor is telling Lois that if Bill drinks again, he will either die or go insane. Now, Bill overhears this. And he takes the first step right there in the hospital before he ever meets Abby and hears about the Oxford group or the other spiritual part of the program. And he writes here, this is him taking the first step on page eight, paragraph two. He says, no words can tell the loneliness and despair I found in that bitter morass of self-pity. Quicksand stretched around me in all directions. I had met my match. I had been overwhelmed. Alcohol was my master. So that's it right there. Alcohol was my master. That's him accepting the first step that he was powerless over alcohol. And he goes and it goes on and says, trembling, I stepped from the hospital, a broken man. Fear sobered me for a bit. Now it actually sobered him for three or four months because this is the summer of 34 when he uh, took his first step in the hospital. But Bill doesn't drink again until November 11th of 34. And Bill drinks again. He says that the the then came the insidious, insidious insanity of that first drink. And on Armistice Day, 1934, I was off again. That's on page eight, paragraph two, three. Now, without steps two to 12, the spiritual awakening didn't th that they provide, the obsession of the mind eventually overtook his step one, but it took it three or four months to, over, to overcome it. Then at the end of that month, it says at the end of the month of, of November 34, he gets a phone call and visit from Ebby, his friend, who introduces Bill to the solution, a simple religious idea and a practical program of action. And that was the Oxford group plan that Ebby was bringing to Bill. That's on page nine at the bottom. Now, Bill is continuing to drink, but he's taking Ebby's advice into his into mind. In fact, he's going to some Oxford group meetings in this period here at the end of, at the end of November to, uh, to, to December. But on December 12th, Bill notices that he's got some of the symptoms of delirium tremens again, and he checks himself back into the hospital to dry out. And that's where he, that's where Ebby comes and visits him in the hospital, and he works all 12 steps in the hospital. And, and that's when he gets absent. That's when he gets his sobriety. And that's when Bill experiences God, which is in the big book on page 40, 14. And a, and a fuller description of it is from the AA Comes of Age on page 23. It talks about Bill's white light experience of God. So step one is enough to start your abstinence and hopefully you work steps two through 12 while you've got that abstinence from step one. And that's why you keep your abstinence by getting that spiritual awakening. First of all, I'm gonna talk about some of the tools to, to, to uh, hold you over until you get the spiritual awakening by working the steps. And then I'll talk about the steps after I talk about the tools. So the first thing to notice is that relapse is, is not an event, it's a process. And if it's a process, you can intervene earlier in the process before you've taken that first bite. And the, the thing is to try to notice some of the early symptoms 
of relapse before you take that first bite. That's what you need to do in order to avoid taking that first bite. And, and this is from that workshop I went to at the uh, Virginia workshop, relapse workshop. And I have the, um, by the way, I didn't so say this exact explicitly, but the output of this workshop is I'm gonna have a PDF of notes that, uh, that will be available to everybody who goes to this workshop. And I'll also have a YouTube video that will have this PowerPoint and my audio part here uh, will be included in that, in that YouTube video. So, uh, and the links for those two will become available within a week or so after I finish the workshop, but this will all be in the, uh, in, in the notes file there too. So this is a list of warning, relapse warning signs, and there are four columns here, but there are four different types of, of, of uh, warning signs. Don't read across, they aren't related to reading across, so read down from the columns there for, for, the, um, for, the, for what the, the relapse signs are. And again, you're not gonna be able to read all these in the, in the, in the minute this is up here, but you can get it out of the notes. And they also have other resources available on the web there. You can go to those links there and, and get more resources from that other relapse prevention workshop. So uh, here's something that I got from the, uh, the AA Big Book study. The, the speaker there talked about the seemingly unimportant decisions or actions that happen. And this is another word for that obsession of the mind, the seemingly unimportant decision. That's when the obsession of the mind kicked in. And that decision that you, was, that you made with the obsession of the mind there is what led to the relapse. And I asked for some examples when I was doing shares and someone said that the relapse, the relapse started after just having some extra salad. You know, extra salad, that's not, that's not gonna hurt. I'll just have a little extra salad. But then they went and had something else and something else. So it started with just having extra salad. Or someone said, when a new sponsor told them, you don't have to call on your food anymore, they thought, great, and they agreed. But then that led to a relapse because that great part of them was the addiction saying, great, I can eat. So those are the seemingly unimportant decisions that eventually led to a relapse. Diminished contact with God. You know, you used to pray more often. Now you're not praying very much. Not going to as many OA meetings. That can lead to a relapse. Thoughts came back that had left, such as thinking about food as entertainment or thinking about abstinence or food as being hard. Emotions might become more volatile or the ego is getting bigger. That's what was happening to me in my first eight years in the program. My ego was getting bigger and bigger. And why do we eat? We eat because we are compulsive by reader and we have that allergy to the body and because we made up some kind of a story to justify binging. And that's the cunning, baffling and powerful obsession of the mind. Suggestions, other suggestions are about relapse, don't. Consider changing relapse to abstinence interrupted or even better, just a bad day in recovery. These can be helpful because going back to day one can lead, lead to postponing day one for months, years, or hundreds of pounds. In other words, counting days can be dangerous, use with caution. If counting days is gonna lead to you, you binging for a long time, use it with caution. Someone said, slips are never just slips. They were always completely plotted and planned out. Other, one, other people suggested keeping a healthy fear of food, identify dangerous food items. It's not healthy to say you were good or bad, to think or talk about cheating on a diet, to have an all or nothing thinking, or to think of OA as just a support group. Prayers can be helpful. And the shortest prayer is thank you. Help me, or more God less Frank. Instead of praying for abstinence, thank God for the gift of abstinence. And finally, reading, reading relapse and 12 step within literature from OA.org is useful. That can be helpful. And here's a suggestion. I never tried this, but someone suggested making three columns on a piece of paper. What am I not giving to God? Why am I not willing to give it to God? And what would God have me be? And to fill in those three columns across, writing across those three columns. Now, I haven't tried this, but someone suggested that it was helpful to them. What can a food plan include? What we eat and don't eat, like red, yellow, and green light foods. The most common red light food items are dessert sugar items, flour products, and salty crunchy foods, probably in that order. Now, one thing I heard at the, uh, the, the July OA um, Los Angeles relapse workshop, there was a suggestion there and it said that if you are struggling, consider changing your yellow light food items into red light food items. That might be why you're struggling. You're trying to treat a yellow light food like a red light food. 
And I personally know someone who made this, took this suggestion to heart, and they had great success with it. it turns out those yellow light foods were triggering them. And by making them into red light foods and having 100% abstinence from them, they were able to uh, be, have a much more serene recovery. How many times a day do we eat? Is it three meals a day or is it three meals in a snack or is it five small meals? Or do you eat when you're physically hungry or no eating after dinner? What times during the day do we eat? How long do we have between meals? How much do we eat? Do we weigh and measure? Do we count calories or do moderate meals? What can a food plan include? How about food behaviors like no fast food or no watching TV or snacking, no second helpings or only eating at a table or no eating out of the refrigerator or pantry, no binging, no bulimia or guilt-free eating. Do we commit our food plan for the day to our sponsors each morning? How exact must this commitment be? How are changes to the food plan handled? And how perfect do we have to do, be? Can we have imperfect abstinence? If we have a behavioral abstinence, perhaps we can have an imperfect abstinence. If we have a red light food abstinence, we have to be perfect about that. When I had a cal counting calories, I had a goal such as 1,800, then I had an upper limit such as 3,000. That allowed, uh, I called it a, a warning strip. If I'm in that 1,800 to 3,000 range, that's the warning strip that if I go over 3,000, I'm, I'm binging. Moderate meals are by definition imperfect. And it can also include no starting over. Starting over is a, if I eat too much at one meal, then I can eat all I want for the rest of the day and I will start over tomorrow. Maybe if I'm lucky, I'll start over tomorrow. No starting over means I just start right away with my continued recovery. It just means I have imperfect abstinence. Continued recovery, I like that. There can be rituals around eating, lighting a candle before eating, blowing it out after, praying before eating, Working steps one, two, three before eating. Can one size fit all? To a large extent, disagreements about food plans or why 12-step food addiction programs have splintered into so many different groups. I wish we could all go back under the OA umbrella because we can take all those people with very strict food plans. They could be perfectly fine here in OA. You know, there's, there's no need to be in a separate food plan to, just because you have a different food plan than I do. So now I'm gonna talk about the steps. You know, I really should talk about all 12 steps. If you've been in that, if you've been in OA for a while and you've got abstinence and you start binging again, you need to get right into the steps and you can do steps 10, 11, and 12 because they encompass almost all the steps. You have to do step one. The first thing you have to do to get out of relapse is to take that step one again. You got to take that step one again and see that you are powerless over food and that you cannot take that first bite. That's, you have to take step one to start getting a recovery, but then you need to work steps the, all the steps to get the spiritual waking that deals with the obsession of the mind. And if you've already worked the steps, you can just work 10, steps 10, 11, and 12 to get that spiritual awakening back that you've lost if you've been binging. So I'm going to talk about how steps 10, 11, and 12 can give you the spiritual awakening as a result of working these steps. So can, the step 10 is continue to take personal inventory and when we were wrong, promptly admit it. And there are five paragraphs in the big book that describe how to take that personal inventory. So I'm going to go through those in detail on this next slide. So the first step is continue to watch for. And in, in, in software engineering, we have this concept called a watchdog timer. It, it could be a task on a computer that wakes up, say, once per second. It checks for some condition. If it finds a condition, it deals with it. And if it doesn't find a condition, it goes back to sleep for a second and wakes up one second later. What I need to do install in here in my brain is a watchdog timer, something that's continually watching for when I'm engaging in one of my character defects. So that's what I need to, to have, a watchdog timer installed. And the instant that I, I notice that I'm enga engaging one of my character defects, that is when I stop, start working step 10. So you have to first notice that I'm engaging in a character defect, and then you can start working step 10 at that point. And the first thing you ask was, was I selfish, dishonest, resentful, or afraid? Now, I'm gonna, on the next slide, I'm going to talk about how all four of those things, in fact, all of my character defects come from selfish and self-centeredness. I mean, it's pretty clear that dishonesty, you're lying to, tr to protect yourself somehow. You're resentful because somebody did something to you or you're afraid that what might happen to you in the future. So you can see that all four of these are all about me, me, me. And that's what all my character defects are about. But th th these are the four categories. And these are the four categories that you work in your fourth step also. And then the first thing you do is you say, God, please remove the defect at once, whatever the defect was. 
Now, this is like doing step six and seven because you're admitting that you can't remove it. I can't remove the defect of self-interest, self-centeredness. I have to ask God to remove the defect. And, and that's step six and seven. And then this is a form of a prayer. So it's like a step 11. So we're doing a prayer here for, so you're covering four, six, seven, and 11. Next, I discuss this with someone immediately. You know, I, I've been in this program for 40 years. I thought this was an optional part of step 10. I thought that you would need to discuss it with your sponsor. If you're, want, if you're not sure if you need to make an amends or not, then you go and talk to your sponsor. I mean, there's some places clearly you need to make an amends. So you just go ahead and make the amends. There are some places where clearly you can't make the amends. So you just don't make the amends. But there were, if there were borderlines, that's where you'd go talk to your sponsor and see if you should make an amends or not. But I've just in the last two years, I've come to believe that this is an essential part of step 10. And, and the reason is, it's like trying to step, do step four by, by, by skipping step five. If you're not telling somebody else that, oh yeah, I had that same character defect come up, come up once again. You know, if you're not willing to take that, that uh, step of admitting that you have that same character defect once again to your sponsor, then you're not gonna get the full recovery that you would get if you did do that. It's gonna be helpful for you to admit to your sponsor that you have the character defect again. Now I have to admit, I don't do this part of the step every single time. I should do this part of the step every single time, but I don't do it. But I, I, my goal is to do it every single time that I have I work a step 10. And my goal is to work a couple of step 10s a day because I know that I engage in my character defect at least a couple of times a day, probably more often than that, but I don't do that either. I mean, I'm, I'm great at preaching about step 10. I'm not as great about actually doing it, but I'm trying to improve. I'm trying to improve on step 10. And then if I've harmed anyone, I make amends quickly. So that's doing steps eight and nine. Now, you know, if, you, if, you, if I just yelled at my wife, I can turn around as quickly as I can and say, I'm sorry, honey, I apologize. So that's, that's making the amends there. If, if um, there are other situations where you can't do it, for example, uh, somebody who was tailgating me and I get really pissed about them tailgating. So I might actually slow down to make them slow down even more. And maybe eventually I'll pull out or maybe they pull around me and pass me, but you know, they're far ahead. There's no way that I'm gonna be able to catch up to them and make amends to them. So what I do is I make amends to somebody else in a similar situation. Next time I notice somebody coming up behind me. Now, this is me driving in the fast lane, maybe 10 miles over the speed limit. So I'm, I'm perfectly legal to be in that fast lane because I'm going over the speed limit, passing other cars. But if somebody wants to come up behind me, I got to get out of the way as quickly as I can. That's how I make amends to people like that in the future. I make amends to people in the future by trying to get out of the way and let them pass me. And then I'll go back in the, tent, in the left lane and go forward again. Then I turn my thoughts to someone to help. Now this is, can be doing step 12. And in fact, you can call somebody in the program that, that's a perfectly good way of doing, of uh, looking, turning your thoughts to someone to help. It can also be helping anybody out there in the world. It can be opening the door for people when they come into the, into the supermarket. It can be you know, uh, discussing world events with the with this, this checkout clerk instead of just you know, rushing through and, and getting, getting my uh, items here. So it can be any, any kind of being helpful to anybody in any situation can be part of that. And, and, look, and, and the thing is, step 10 gets me to look for opportunities to do that. I may not be looking for the opportunities before I do the step 10. After I've done a step 10, then I'm looking for an opportunity where I can help someone else. So that's, that's the step 12. And then at, at the, fi the final thing it says is love and tolerance of others is our code. And that's what we're trying to learn here, love and tolerance of others by, by working these steps. So this is the steps that you go through to work step 10 on the spot. Now, the selfish, dishonest, resentful, or afraid, I said I was gonna show how those are all related to selfish and self-centeredness. And I've got, I, I've got a quiz that somebody gave me it. I added some, uh, a, a couple of questions to it, but I started with four questions. I now have six questions and here's the quiz. And this is the quiz of, am I selfish? If I'm resentful, it's because someone did not do what I wanted them to do in the past. They did not do it my way. And that is being selfish. If I am angry, it's because someone is not doing what I want them to do right now. They are not doing it my way. And that is being selfish. If I am fearful, it's because I know that someone is not going to do what I want them to do in the future. They are not going to do it my way, and that is being selfish. If I feel guilty or remorseful, it's because I got my way at your expense, and that is being selfish. If I feel jealous or envious, it's because someone has something I want, and I want it now, and that is being selfish. 
So any of these character defects here all come from that root of selfishness and self-centeredness. That is the, the second addiction I have besides my addiction to compulsive overeating is the addiction to selfishness and self-centeredness. And I need God's help on these, these character defects as much as I need them for everything else that I do. So, so step 10 continues with the 10 step promises. We have ceased fighting anyone or anything, even alcohol. This is, this is what you're gonna get if you get the spiritual awakening as a result of, of working steps 10, 11, and 12. If tempted, we recoil as from a hot flame. That is how we react so long as we keep in fit spiritual condition. Now, you notice that I call myself a recovered compulsive reader. The reason I do that is because, well, I do that and I, and I claim that I'm recovered, but I'm not cured. Because the 10th step says right here, it says, we are not cured of alcoholism. What we really have is a daily reprieve contingent on the maintenance of our spiritual condition. And that daily reprieve means that I'm recovered. On a daily basis, I'm recovered from compulsive overeating because I'm not compulsively overeating today. I'm recovered from compulsive overeating and I can maintain that by working on my fit spiritual condition by doing steps 10, 11, and 12 in, the, in this program. Now, there's a 10th step prayer. It says, how can I best serve thee? Thy will, not mine, be done. These are the thoughts which go for this constantly. The words, thy will, not mine, that's what I put into my, uh, my calendar event that gets me a notification six times a day that thy will, not mine, be done. And then step 11 is sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood him, praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. Now, you know, over the years, I tried to get a step 11 practice going, and, and I never really got it going until about, uh, I don't know, eight, eight or nine years ago, something like that, when I went and took a commercial meditation class. And the thing is, I did all the homework. The homework was meditate every day. So for eight weeks, I meditated every day for 15 minutes or so. And I didn't immediately start up a daily meditation practice there. But within a few months after that class, I really started up a daily meditation practice that I kept going for quite a few years. I don't, I don't keep track of it anymore. I don't meditate every day anymore. But I did like maybe five or six years of daily meditation, kept track of by a, 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 an app on my phone. I could keep track of my meditation. So meditation is definitely helpful. And, you know, I'm not a big prayer person, but I like the short prayers, more God, less Frank, um, help, you know, those kinds of short prayers. Now there's two forms of meditation that are mentioned in the big book. Some people think of these as being the uh, tenth step. When we retire at night, we constructively review our day. And then on awakening, let us think about the 24 hours ahead. But if you read the big book carefully, he's, calling both of these things a meditation because they're, they're what he comes when he talks about meditation. And he knows, I know there are periods of meditation because he says, we usually conclude these periods of meditation with a prayer. So both the evening and the morning practice are meditation practices in the evening and morning. Now, some people do them right, writing. You can do writing meditations. So writing meditation is a perfectly good way of doing a meditation. And some people do, a, 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 a they call it a 10th step written inventory in the evening. That's really 11 step meditation inventory in the evening. And then on awakening, you think about it 24 hours a day. And that's where we ask God for inspiration. So asking God for inspiration, that's asking for my higher self to inspire me throughout the day. That's, that's the higher self trying to inspire me. So that's how I do step 11. And then step, there's the step 11 prayers. We go through the day, we pause when agitated or doubtful and ask for the right thought or action. Again, it's coming from the higher power, the higher self within me, that right thought or action. We constantly remind ourselves we are no longer running the show, humbly asking, saying to ourselves many times each day, thy will be done. So again, that's how I incorporate both step 10 and 11 prayer into my six times a day reminder. But it's again, the, I am no longer running the show. It's the Frank that's no longer running the show. That's the Frank that has to get out of the running the show business and ask for the higher self to help him. Now, the A 12 and 12 also has the, the other prayer, the Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace prayer that I really like. And finally, step 12, having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps. That's the only thing you get from working steps 2 through 12 is a spiritual awakening. It's a spiritual awakening that allows you to, to not act on that obsession of the mind so you don't have to take that first bite just because you do have an obsessive thought that comes in. The, the spiritual awakening allows you to, to let go of that thought. It does get amplified because we don't engage in our character defects as much. You know, when I'm engaging in my character defects, you know, I might as well just go ahead and eat too because I, you know, I'm doing everything else wrong. 
So if we can live a more spiritual life and not engage in our character defects and have that spiritual awakening as a result of working these steps, then we have a chance of keeping our abstinence for a long period of time. We tried to carry this message to compulsive readers. This is an essential part of step 12. Again, this is the opposite of being selfish and self-centered. If I wanted to be selfish and self-centered, I wouldn't put on a workshop like this. I would just you know, keep it all to myself. It's my secret, I, I get to keep it. I can only keep it if I give it away. So I can only, I can only keep my abstinence if I had become a sponsor and, and sponsor other people in, in the program. If I share at meetings, you know, when the meetings ask for sharing and nobody raises their hand, nobody gets up, do service, get up and share. You know, don't, don't, don't let there be a long absence, a long period of silence in a meeting when they're asking for people to share. Because by sharing, you are carrying the message to the other compulsive readers in the meeting with you. And we practice these principles in all our affairs. And there's a principle associated with every one of these steps and they're all spiritual principles. So we pr try to practice all those spiritual principles in all of our affairs. And that's what contributes to our spiritual awakening. So that's the end of my, my uh, relapse talk. So I'm pretty much on time here. So now we can do the Ask It Basket questions again, and I will turn off the screen sharing for the Ask It Basket questions. I am Chris, Compulsive Overeater. Thanks for your service. I had a question. I know that the big book was written in the early, you know, 1935 or something, I think. Yep. Um, so if we can't get in touch with our sponsor, do you think it's okay to text a 10 step? Oh, is that, I know it's better to, you know, talk, but if we can't do that, can we, what do you think about texting? Oh, absolutely. I, I mostly text it. I, and mostly, I mean, if there's something that I have to talk to him about, you know, that's complicated, you know, how do I go about making the amends or something like that? I will call because it needs to be a conversation. But most of the time, it just has to be admitting, you know, I, I, gave the finger to a speeder on the freeway. You know, that's that's one of my frequent 10 steps. So it's just texting that to my sponsor is the only thing I have to admit. Yes, one more time, I was a jerk. You know, I was a jerk on the freeway one more time. Aww. That's what's important is to admit that I was a jerk. And it doesn't need any response from him. He knows he doesn't have to respond when I text him things like that. Um, it's just me admitting that I was a jerk one more time. So uh, yeah, it's perfectly fine to do it uh, with a text message. I'm sure Bill would have done it with text messages if he had it back at the time. <laughs> hey guys i'm gina a compulsive overeater thanks frank for being here with us today um i've got a lot out of your second your second share about the steps as well as the, as your story um my question is regarding um you talked about the phenomenon of cravings that come after you put put the if you have a substance addiction if after you put the first bite in of something that you're addicted to um how do you what's going on if you're still getting cravings in between meals when your food plan doesn't consist of any substances that you norm that normally trigger you know like i'm for instance i'm addicted to sugar um and if i don't eat any sugar or any heavy flour in my meal and then yet and and it's proportional but yet all throughout in between meals i'm getting horrible cravings that are hard to to suppress what what is that i mean i know that's the obsession of the mind because obviously the physical allergy is not being triggered but how do you how do you um navigate through those and what's going on there well it, you know i don't i can't guarantee uh diagnose anything about you in particular or anybody in particular but that's the obsession of the mind masquerading as a craving mm. it's the because see the, the the obsession of the mind knows that Oh, you know, once once when she did eat that ice cream, then she couldn't stop. So if I convince her she has that craving going on right now, then she'll go ahead and eat the ice cream. It's the obsession of the mind figuring out that that's the way to get to you, to convince you that you have the craving. And it, and it's the thoughts about the craving is what you're really having, I believe. I don't know. You know, I, mm -hmm. I can't guarantee what's going on inside of anybody else. But this is, I, I think my problem is thinking. That's why a mm -hmm. lot of my favorite a lot of my favorite sayings are about how thinking is not the solution to the problem. You know, it, I would I would make suggestions of, you know, get get out of thinking about like that. Go do something physical. Go do something that uh, is going to take you away from those thoughts. If you're mm -hmm. just sitting there, you know, alone in your room thinking about, boy, yeah, I really do have a craving for that. You know, I really should go get some of that. 
just try to see if that's really a, a physical craving or is it just your mental obsession trying to convince you that you have a physical craving? That's, that's the only thing I can suggest. I don't have a good solution. Um, thank okay. you, Frank. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Ray Kerbin, Compulsive Eater. My name is Gary. Thank you so much, Frank. Um, sure. So here's the thing. Uh, I believe I have a substance addiction, so, but uh, I haven't ingested those substances in 32 years, so I don't have a problem with them. I haven't triggered the allergy. But like you, I'm a, I, a major part of my addiction is volume or quantity. I'm a quantity eater. And I, and, and I, I enjoy your discussion about substance versus, versus uh, behavioral addiction. And I, and I don't think we discussed that enough, but I was, I was wondering in, in terms of uh, quantity and, and volume eating, uh, is that behavioral a substance and do I treat it like a substance addiction or do I treat it like a behavioral addiction? I'm really uncertain. Thank you so much. Well, you, you can treat it like a substance addiction if you are willing to weigh and measure everything that goes into your mouth. You know, if you have so many calories of protein, so many calories of carbohydrates, so many calorie ounces, you know, whatever, whatever measurement you're using, grams, ounces, so many grams or ounces of this, that, and the other thing. If you, if you have some guidelines like that and you're willing to weigh and measure everything that goes into your mouth, you can make it into a bright line abstinence and, and have the same kind of bright line abstinence there that you have with your, with your, your, your other red light food items. So it can be a substance addiction if you are willing to do that. I'm not willing to do that. So I'm, try, I'm doing it with the moderate meal plan. And, and I use my scale weighing my body as the backup to see whether or not I'm actually being honest with myself about whether that's a moderate meal. If I keep having too many large, larger meals than normal, that weight is going to creep up. And that's the, that's the backup signal that I use to then say, I've got to do something about it. Now, you know, I, as I told my story, that weight, weight crept up for a couple of years, several years until it finally got to the point where I did something about it with the one, two, three practice that I've been doing. But, you know, whatever it takes, you know, it, it, just be honest with yourself, you know, is the main thing. And if, if it works better for you to be a substance addiction for everything, then weigh and measure. That's how you can be a, be a substance addiction for everything. Thank you. Um, I had a question about, uh, did you ever have any sort of big life events come up in this 14 year period of abstinence that sort of threaten your, your um, sobriety, so to speak, around the food? Or have you seen that in the different workshops you've done and people that successfully got through big life challenges absently versus people that didn't. And if you had any experience or, or seen that, I relapsed, I had a series of major life things and I just laid down and crashed and relapsed. Uh, so I was wondering if you've seen, seen what you've seen in people successfully navigate life challenges, big ones in a short period of time versus people that haven't successfully navigated that using the program. Well, I, I mean, the, the, I haven't had any personal big problems, but I've had family big problems. A family member had a substance abuse issue that I had to deal with and, and you know, get them into treatment and all kinds of things like that, which was, you know, very challenging and, and uh, heartbreaking. But, uh, you know, it, it, it didn't, I didn't overeat over it. it. I wasn't tempted to overeat over it. it you know, if anything, uh, I think I was probably more abstinent just during dealing with that because I had that big issue to deal with instead of it's my idle time you know when I don't have anything to do then oh eating that's something to do that's where I tend to have more of a problem with with uh doing recreational eating I guess my question is and thank you so much everything's been really informative so I wanted to say that first um but I I had heard in the past that addicts brains are different than other person's brains, other people brains. Have you ever um, heard that before? Or could you comment on that? That you know, when they look at the activity in an addict's brain, whether it's alcohol, food, or substance abuse, they have different patterns, different behaviors in their brains, which can explain why we have this illness, which helps me to understand it a little better. Well, it, it, I, don't, I don't know of any neurological studies that have found any particular things that happen in addicts' brains compared to normal brains. Um, you know, the, 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 major, the major symptom is that normal people can have one and stop. The abnormal people like us can't, whatever it is, you know, that, so that, that's the abnormality. It's a behavioral abnormality. I don't know, there, there has to be some mental change too that causes that to happen, but 
that hasn't, I don't know of anything like that. And I haven't been able to, to find out anything about that. Sorry. Okay, thank you. Um, Joan P has a question, Joan. Hi everyone, I'm Joan, compulsive overreader. Thank you, Frank. I, I had a question about um, giving power to numbers. Uh, you mentioned about weighing yourself and counting days and recounting days. Um, I personally have to be very careful with that because the, I don't want the number to decide whether or not I'm having a good day or whether or not I'm a good person. Can, can you talk about that a little bit? Yes, absolutely. I, and I, you know, this is definitely not a one size fits all program. I don't think I'm not trying to say any of you should do what I do. This is just what help, help, helps me. And I understand that thing. I, I think coming from a scientific point of view, I realize it's a signal with noise. So even though I don't like it when my weight is up three pounds from one day to the next, I don't like that, but I just put it away. It's, it's noise. It'll probably be down two pounds the, the next day, you know, just ig ignore the noise. I look for the long-term signal, but you know, if those numbers see being a scientist, again, numbers are good. I, you know, I deal with numbers. I don't deal with feelings and thoughts and things like that. So um, for me, it's helpful, but if it's not helpful to you, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't weigh yourself every day. You know, find some way to, to, to have your abstinence. And I noticed that we are over our limit here. So I think we should, if, unless there's a burning desire for a question, th this is what the contents of that note file that I'm going to send you is going to be. Um, I've got version two. And I've got a version one file right now, but I'm going to update it for version two. And most of this is what I've talked about here, but there's some suggested OE relapse literature. And, the, and I've got the old pamphlet before you take that first bite compulsive bite, remember, it's out of print now, but I, I copied the entire old pamphlet into here. So you got that, that pamphlet. And then there's, these are the two appendixes that uh, I've talked about. There's an appendix about taking the first step from the big book and the substance versus behavioral addiction and imperfection. So that's the PDF file you're gonna get. And the, the, bit, the, the links are gonna be like this, this bit.ly link, OA relapse notes V2, OA relapse note V2. Those are the, um, those won't work right now. Don't use them right now, but I will send you the email and that's what will be in the email saying that those, those links are now live and you can get those, those links that way. You can see the version one one. If you just leave off the V2 here where it says V2, if you leave off that, in fact, I'll post these into the chat window. You can go look at the current old version one PDF note and the old version one uh, video. So um, I'll do that. So now we're Correct. going to do the writing exercise for 10 minutes. Oh, so here are the writing prompts. What are symptoms you have noticed that, that can show that you were on the relapse process before the first bite? What other ways are there to keep an absence between step one and step 12? If you had a relapse, do you think you really and fully took step one as you binged or were you telling yourself, I will start tomorrow? Does that mean you believed you had the power to stop tomorrow? And do you have any other thoughts? This is the catch all. Any other thoughts about relapse or about recovery from relapse? So go ahead and start writing for 10 minutes. After the writing exercise, there was sharing about the writing exercise for the rest of the workshop. To find out more about Overeaters Anonymous, check out www.oa.org. You can find OA literature and also local OA meetings or online meetings or Zoom meetings to attend. I welcome questions and feedback about this presentation. The accompanying notes PDF file is located here, bit.ly slash OA relapse notes v2. Note that bit.ly links are case sensitive, so the URL is lowercase bit dot ly forward slash uppercase OA lowercase r e l a p s e uppercase n lowercase o t e s uppercase v 2 thank you for your attention